those sheets had a lot of, you know, dud. You know, and it was every year it was like match of the year, you know, hmm. Abu Zago versus Naposano in the karaoke and hall. Like, yeah, right, you fucking saw it when. You saw it from, from, from fucking Oakland? Fuck you. You know, telescope? Fucking Hubble? San Jose. <laughs> um, Is that where he's from? Near there, right? Yeah, fuck him. I never liked him, never will. How's your life, buddy? Bet you ain't <laughs> better than mine. Oof. <laughs>
Oh, no. Yeah, I've spelled it down wrong to begin with. And by the way, it's Akira Hokuto, not Hokuto. Just for the record. And I don't mean to be a dick, because sometimes I know I can be. But it's Akira Hokuto. Shinobu, I just want to say Shinobi. So, to say it right once on this, because if you can splice it in, so we just use that sound <laughs> clip every time, it is Akira Hokuto versus Shinobu Kandori. That's right. It's so if you can splice that clip out every time I say a name. I really like when Shinobu came down to the ring. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm hoping you'll do. Because I'm just going to say Shinobi. I know yeah. I will. Um... Because that's the game If I've the video was on. on us, it would be like a camera. But you know that scene in The Simpsons where they're like, Mr. Simpson, no! Yeah. And the clock keeps changing in the background. Yeah. That's what it would be like with us. Somebody had to take the babysitter home. Then I noticed she was sitting on her sweet can. I grab her sweet can. Oh, just thinking about her can. I just wish I had her sweet, 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 sweet can. What was happening in the wrestling world at this time? WCW had just held this Super Brawl 3 event the month before, which was headlined by Sting vs. Big Van Vader in a White Castle strap match. Also, Barry Windham gained the NWA world title from the Great Muta in a near 20 minute match. CNWL had held a 37th anniversary show on the 2nd of April, which saw Mano Negro regain the NWA World Middleweight Championship in a two out of three falls match against Oro. AAA held their first Triple Mania event in front of almost 50,000 fans. In the main event, CN Karras beat Conan in a two out of three falls match where the loser had to retire. If you are familiar with WCW in the mid to late 90s, that will make you smirk as Conan wrestled for years and years after this. On the 4th of April, the WWF held their infamously awful WrestleMania 9 event. Gun appeared and was interjected into a match and ended the show as champion. April 2nd, 1993 is fondly remembered by wrestling fans the world over as being the date that held one of the highest rated wrestling shows of all time. AJW invited women from JWP, LLPW and FMW to compete in a night full of interpromotional battles in front of 16,500 fans inside the Yokohama Arena. And yes, you heard that right. This women's show drew 16,500 people. That's how big Joshi Wrestling was at the time. The show even won the Wrestling Observer Newsletter's Major Wrestling Show of the Year Award. All of the matches on the card featured AJW talent against one of the outsiders, either from one of the three Joshi companies, ENWL, or an American freelancer. This made for entirely fresh dream matches between some of the best wrestlers in the world. This also made it so each match had a unique style with most of the FMW talent being more power based. The hybrid styles of the competitors from both JWP and AJW and then the shooters from LLPW being the most technically gifted. So what do you think about this Vicky? So All Japan Women's, they were the top Joshi promotion of the time and all their stars had to retire at the age of 26 and they said it was to appeal to a fan base of young girls. I don't agree with that being a growing up as a young girl that liked wrestling. Like when I started watching wrestling, I mean I always grew up with my granddad watching it but when I started watching it properly I was in year four in school Mm. which for anybody watching outside of the UK that would be eight or nine something like that yeah yeah so yeah eight or nine when i started watching it properly and that was early attitude era so that was what 1999-2000 was when i really got into it and i remember trish stratus was my favorite lita was my favorite and they weren't the youngest of the divas coming through at the time Mm. and yeah being eight or nine like being a young girl watching wrestling i wouldn't have thought if they're older than 26 they're too old (laughs) No, no, me neither. It seems crazy now to think that, you know, if you look at, say, well, we'll, look, we'll always go back to the WWE because that's the one that we're most familiar with, I guess. Yeah. But um, people like AJ Styles and Shinsuke and 
even the people down at NXT, they were all quite a bit older than 26 when they first came in, even. Well, Asuka must have been mid-30s when she came to WWE. Yeah. She and she doesn't exactly look old. <laughs> no, she doesn't look old at all. Just seems ridiculous. But I guess if that's... If all of their superstars or wrestlers, whatever they call them over there, are within that age group, I think you could have the majority of your roster as that, but you could have the other ones but maybe not feature as much on the card, but still have them being part of the promotion. I think making them completely retire at that age, is it just blows my mind. You had yeah. JWP, which was, they call it, say, the entertainer portion. they pretty much always a little bit lower than All Japan Women's. And they had a lot of the stars that had left All Japan Women's by the time they turned 26. You had then Ladies Legend Pro Wrestling. And this was when it was more grappling based. So they were more like the shooters, they call them. So they were more MMA based people. We had Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling. And they were then more of the ultra violent matches. So they had death matches and things like that. So you had all these different styles that were big at the time, but completely different, all mashed together in this show. This wasn't the first time that AJW put on one of these super shows. They also put on a big super show in 1994 called Big Egg Universe Show. What a name. Why Big Egg? Well, they play Mario Kart. Or that level where there's the big egg. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Was that the ring? Just that big egg going around in a circle? I don't know, Big Egg. It's such a weird name. Can I offer you a nice egg in this trying time? Yeah, he's got an egg, you might oh, ah! Really obscure reference. Can we cut to that clip from Russell Howard? Look at this giant egg. <laughs> Look at it compared to a Fanta. Yes, we can. You're about to have your mind blown to smithereens. This is one of the most amazing news stories I've ever seen. Take a look at this giant egg from a farm in southeastern Iowa. The egg came from a chicken named Aussie, and it measures more than three inches long and weighs more than four ounces. Look how it compares with a normal egg. Holy shit! Are you getting this? Look at the size of that egg! I wonder how big it is compared to a coca. Amazing! The Big Egg Wrestling Universe was a professional... I can't take you seriously. I know. The Big Egg Wrestling Universe. It just sounds weird. Oh, God, the gobbledygook is going to come out of it and everything. <laughs> that, it all makes sense. It doesn't make sense. and then Nothing it makes, makes sense. sense anymore. Oh, no. Why have we brought him back into it? <laughs> the Big Egg Wrestling Universe was a professional wrestling event held by All Japan Women's in the Tokyo Dome. On November 20th, 1994, that show was attended by 32,500 fans. Jeez. The event generated approximately 4 million in revenue as well from ticket sales. That's mental. That is absolutely mental. In that one, they had loads of different people as well. They also had um, Medusa, who was a Londra Blaze at the time, and she was their champion, and she faced um, Bull Nakano on the show. It's just weird that the WWF sent somebody there as well. That's how big this show was. You know you think WrestleMania lasts quite a long time these days? Yeah, it's what, seven, eight hours? Something like that. This event lasted ten hours. And it featured 23 matches. That's just way too long. Yeah, there's no way I could sit through that long. Like, ten and a half hours. I think the only thing I could do for that long is sleep or... Go to Disney World. That's the only thing I could do in that amount of time. But I couldn't sit at an event for that long. No. I can't sit still for one film in the cinema. I have. I always wriggle. Like I can't sit still for that long. You struggle at this table doing this. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) But that's a long time. How can anybody like be focused for that long? You'd have to take a break. There'd have to be an intermission. I'm not actually sure if there was. There must have been. Yeah, it's like when you're in the theatre. They put a break halfway through. Hopefully there was. And I'm always the one that's like, I'll go up and get get a drink or get you ice cream or whatever. I just can't sit for this long. Akira Hokuto debuted for All Japan Women's Pro Wrestling shortly before her 18th birthday. Hokuto immediately stood out from the crowd, winning All Japan Women's Rookie of the Year award in 1985. The next year, she won AJW's Junior Championship 
and participated in AJW's Match of the Year. In 1987, Hokuto won AJW's top tag team belt, the WWWA World Tag Team Championships. 12 days later, however, the two lost the titles to the Red Typhoons in a two out of three falls match. During the finish of this match, Hokuto took a tombstone pile driver off the second rope and broke her neck. She wrestled the entirety of the second and third falls, sometimes holding her head in place with her hands. This gained Hokuto a reputation for toughness. It's one of the worst things I think I've ever seen. How does she not, like, die? Nobody should be taking tombstone pile drivers from the middle rope. It's just ridiculous. So the fact that after that she came back and she still had matches like this is insane. In 1990, Hokuto was booked to win the Japan Grand Prix, AJW's annual tournament to determine the number one contender to the top singles belt, the WWWA World Single Championship. However, she once again suffered a severe injury. During a Grand Prix match against Manami Toyota, Hokuto performed a plancher and crashed her knee into the ringside metal barrier. She tore open her knee and was rendered unable to walk. Crying, she tied a bandage around her leg, pulled herself back into the ring and attempted to continue the match. It was clearly impossible, however, and she was removed from the tournament. I think there's things like this show just how tough she was. Like, she never wanted to give up. But there's being tough, and that's just so dangerous. No, it really is. It's being tough, but the promoter should stop that. But that should be the ref to stop it. I agree. I agree. Shinobu Kandori captured the bronze medal at the 1984 World Judo Championships. She laid the plan to compete at the 1988 Summer Olympics, but halfway to the Olympics, she lost motivation for judo competition. Kandori considered becoming a trainer, but she then became interested in pro wrestling. She eventually retired from judo in order to pursue that career. Kandori joined the recently established Japan Women's Pro Wrestling in 1986. Riding on her background as a judo medalist, she adopted the gimmick of an arrogant martial artist, stating in an interview that she hated professional wrestling and that she could beat the champion in 10 seconds. With her popularity quickly rising, Kandori came to be considered one of JWP Shitenos, along with Sato, Remni Kazama and Nancy Kumi. Her real life friendship with Sato, however, would sour after Sato gave Kandori a real eye injury during a match. In a match on July 6, 1987, Sato went off script and legitimately attacked Kandori, hitting her repeatedly in her still healing eye. Rude. Very rude. Without being warned or punished by the promotion afterwards. The situation finally exploded in an infamous incident later on in 1987, when Kandori attacked Sato in revenge and beat her in the ring for several minutes. This inflicted injuries that led to Sato's retirement. That's awful. Why did the promoters not do anything? I have no idea at all. So Kandori left the company then after the incident and tried to join All Japan Women's, but she was unable to do so due to contractual reasons, and that's how she ended up in Ladies Legend, Pro Wrestling. Dangerous Queen Kettesen Yokohama Kyokugen. Tuikoto de Mazwa Akakona des. Hokuto Akira Senshu. Ya Kishakai can be Christmasteo. Aita Katashinato Moimasenista. Are you Katashika Diginai or I Chatara? Josh Saikyo no Kandori to you. Anashari Maskerdo. Darga it tender Josh Saikyo te. Temedute Lagara. Yatokono Hia Kishate Ganjea. I no Bagano Tsura Hagastia Karana. We start with them both in the ring staring at each other while Akira is kneeling down, sword in hand, huge white wig and kabuki style mask on. What did you think about his look here, Vicky? It's a strong look. <laughs> it's a very strong look. Uh, definitely distinctive and very Japanese. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. You can tell that Asuka was inspired by her with the mask. Or yeah. the, there might have been other Japanese wrestlers that had the mask, but I've never seen anybody else. What Pokemon did you say she looked like? 
jinx. Right, okay. Yeah, that's the way. It was the, it was the hair that did it. Definitely. They both pace around the ring like wild lions sizing each other up until Akira charges forward with a huge forearm strike that appears to lay out Shinobu cold. Akira grabs the microphone and starts yelling at Shinobu. But since I can't understand Japanese, I have no idea what she is saying, but I can still feel the intensity in her voice. Shinobu gets back to her feet with a huge lariat and tries to lock in a form of armbar, but Akira just about makes it to the ropes. Akira starts screaming out in pain with her arms still held behind her back as Kondori paces in the ring. Kondori actually reminds me here of Chozu out of Karate Kid 2. The intense look on her face in the yellow and black attire. Live or die, man. Die. Wrong. Ah. Akira is still screaming on the outside as the ref and trainers are trying to pull her arm back into place as it looks actually dislocated. What did you think of Akira Hokuto's cell in here? I thought she sold it really well. It looked painful. Hmm. And the fact that they had that cooling spray, I'm not sure if it's cooling spray or... Yeah, yeah. But it just adds provenance to it and it makes it so much more believable. Yeah, it does, definitely. It looks like um, in football when they take a really bad knock and the trainer comes on, starts spraying the cooling spray on their knees. The first time that she tries to get back in the ring, she is abruptly kicked straight back out. So the second time she approaches it much more cautiously. Kandori grabs her and delivers stiff looking forearms and Akira replies with landing stiff looking kicks and a huge knee until Kandori catches Akira's leg and Akira scrambles like crazy to make it to the ropes. Even if you've never seen a match from Shinobu Kondori before, just by these opening exchanges, you can see that you must avoid them at all costs. And if you do get caught, then you are in trouble extremely quick. The next move that I think they were going for was that Hokuto, while wrapped up, was meant to kick both of her feet off the top rope to reverse the move, but she misses and they both just kind of fall to the ground. Now, I'm in two minds here. One, this was obviously a botch and wasn't how it was meant to go. Or two, it felt more real because it didn't look choreographed. I'm not sure which side of the fence I'm on at the moment. I think it was a botch, but they sold it well for a botch. Yeah, I think it was definitely a botch, but it did play into it that this is more real and more of a fight than, say, the last two matches that we've watched in this series that were very highly choreographed and very slick. They both make their way to the outside and again it's a bit sloppy as Akira sets up what looks to be an acai moonsault but Shinobu scouts it and clotheslines are back in. But again the timing is slightly off and it doesn't quite look right. Shinobu lands a strong looking body slam in the centre of the ring and looks to lock in a straight armbar and Akira and this is one bit that I love she actually did the shoot right thing. She rolled to her knees to release some of the pressure and tried to escape her elbow. Shinobu then switches to a front face lock or guillotine as she feels that she's losing the hold. That's good that they're using like proper like MMA tactics. Yeah, it's the actual right thing to get out. It's not like a wrestling, this looks better if I yeah. escape this way. It is actually how you should escape. They both trade different submissions until they make it back to the outside. And in the most memorable spot of the match, Akira sets up a tombstone pile driver on a table, but it's reversed and Shinobu delivers a huge tombstone of her own, which leaves a big dent in the table and Akira Hokuto gets busted open big time. What did you think about the tombstone on the outside? I'd really liked it. It was a really good reversal because I didn't expect the reversal to happen. Right. But it was also really nice to see women using the announce table because mm. you just don't see it. As I said, going back to WWE, as that's what I know, it's very rare you see women using the announce table. I mean, occasionally they'll grab a steel chair. Yeah. But that's about as far as it goes with mm. weapons. Or going back to Attitude Era, you would have... Lita do a moonsault through a table, but that was usually in a tag match with the Hardys. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. something that was a go-to in a singles match, but I think no. it should be used more. I guess 
They don't because they probably think it's too violent for women. Maybe. Just like you rarely see a death match for women yeah. in like mainstream. But I just thought it was like a, it was a good spot. But mm. there was an awful lot of blood. I don't know where she bladed, but that was a lot of blood. Well, I thought that as well. I couldn't tell watching even to the rest of the match. It looked like it was then the... What part of the head's that? I'm pointing to Vicky. <laughs> right down the middle of the head. Is it parting? Yeah, maybe. But Oh, blood I mean, in the head is worse. I've had, hot, I've had like a spot on my head before like a cut. Yeah. And the, Oh, it's horrible. So, and there was just so much blood. You couldn't tell where it was coming from. I'm not sure. That was almost like a mask. She looked a bit like Carrie. She did look like Carrie. Did you notice how many cameramen were around her when she was trying to get back to her feet? I can't say I did. There was hundreds of them. It's something that I I always notice because I always miss it from wrestling. I always miss the camera flashes anyway, but it gives it more of that sport feel when there's loads of cameramen trying to get the right shot. When Akira Hokuto is getting up, I think that's one of the most striking visuals I've ever seen in wrestling. It's up there with Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 13 or Mick Foley smiling in the corner of the ring at King of the Ring 98 in that Hell in the Cell match. Shinobu takes charge and lands devastating forearms to put down her opponent. Already this is a lot slower paced than the previous episodes that we've watched in this series and it's more about the drama I think rather than the high spots. Shinobu lands two running drop kicks off the ropes but Akira catches the third and drags her to the outside and then into the seating areas and throws her into a mountain of chairs. What are your thoughts on wrestling and the crowds? I'm not a fan. I've literally put in my notes, where are they going? Stop it. (laughs) Just stop it. I just think going into the crowd, to me, it looks naff. Mm. And it's harder to sell it because you've got to be so conscious of like people around and I just, I don't have time for it personally. I never have. Like, there's so much space around the ring and things you can use. There's no, never any need. I know what you mean. I think back then even, it was harder, not harder, it was um, more difficult for the people in the actual stadium to see. Because they wouldn't have had like the big screens like they do these days. So every time they went into the crowd, it's only the people that are right next to them and seeing what's going on. Yeah, I'd never thought of it like that. I just don't think it looks good. Mm. That's fair enough. But they did really sell it. I literally put, where are they going? Stop it. Hokutu is really selling this. And that's an awful lot of blood. It was. It was just. That getting... was my three lines from this, this part. It just gets worse and worse. Akira looks like a mad woman here as she's throwing Kandori into the chairs and into other people and she's starting to bleed buckets and buckets full. They both pretty much crawl back into the ring and as Akira throws her hair back, you can see just how much she is bleeding. As Kandori enters the ring, we see that she has been busted open as well now, but nowhere near the same level. Akira lands a pretty solid looking boot to the face on Kandori and that's what it is, just a massive boot to the face. Then, as if that wasn't enough, she follows it up another two times. They looked painful. They did. I remember Mick Foley saying when we went to his Q and A, mm-hmm. and he said, "When wrestling looks painful, it is." Yeah, yeah. He said, "If it looks like it hurt, it probably did." Yeah. Those bits aren't are the fake and that's always stuck with me and that was what at least 10 years ago we went to that probably akira goes for a spinning back kick but gets caught and then starts to get roughhoused with forearms and kicks shinobu sets up what looks to be a suplex but instead just drops her over the top rope to the floor followed by a high cross body to the floor that looks really painful as well the way she just dropped her the way she fell over the rope yeah I think because it was one of those that you didn't see the landing, so she just kind of falls out of shot. And because it's quite dark around the ring, it looks like she just fell in. Yeah, she was already bleeding loads, but she just kind of fell into darkness. Yeah, I think it's like you didn't see the landing and you just saw and just saw the blood. You're like, ooh. Another thing that I love about Japanese matches, did you like seeing all the young wrestlers in their track suits on the outside? Again, I'm not a huge fan of it. No? No, I know that um, New Japan do it as well, don't they? It's like quite yeah. common in Japan. Yeah. But I think that I'm too busy looking around the edge to see who's there and see if it's anybody I recognise. Yeah. So for me, it takes it away. I just get really distracted. Mm. Maybe it's too much going on for you. Yeah. 
Same with the cameraman. In the same way that they slightly botched the move earlier in the match, they attempt to do it again and it goes exactly the same way as earlier. So was it actually planned to look like this? I still can't tell. The crowd are brilliant here because as soon as Kandori goes for any type of hold, they start screaming as they know that as soon as one is locked in tight, then it's all over. This time she goes for a cross-faced chicken wing but again, Akira just about scrambles to the ropes. Another move name that I like. The cross face chicken wing? Yeah. It used to be um, Bob Backlund's move back in the early 90s as well. It's just a good name. It is, it's a great name. Both struggling to their feet, Akira lands a huge, horrible looking pile driver onto her opponent and makes you wince. In an equally wincy spot. Is wincy a word? Yeah, why not? Yeah, we're using it. In an equally. Inqu- Inquiry Inquiry is is not not a word. word. (laughs) In an equally wince-making spot, Akira delivers a thuddering spinning back kick that bounces off Shinobu's head. And the way she sells here is incredible. She kind of hits the ropes and just kind of slides down them one by one. It just, it looks brilliant. Akira then goes for another spinning back kick but misses and Shinobu capitalises with a knee bar. But again, it's broken up by a rope break. It's followed by a DDT, but again, it can only get a two count. Kondori locks in an inverted triangle choke and then tries another knee bar, and Akira again just about makes it to the ropes, this time not as frantically as before as she is slowing down due to the blood loss and only just about touches the ropes with her fingertips. They both exchange strikes in the middle of the ring and Akira lands a lovely looking suplex. She grabs hold of the hair and pulls her opponent back down. Akira Hokuto hits a massive splash off the top rope, but instead of going for the cover, she decides to go to the top rope again, but Shinobu manages to get her knees up just in time. I was surprised she counted after that frog splash because that looked looked like a finisher. It was a really good frog splash. It did. It did look like that was going to be the end. Akira hits a lovely looking bridging suplex for another close count. I thought her shoulders were on the mat. I thought that was a three count. Yeah, it, it, was, it might be that one actually. There's one and it's like, yeah, it was oh, that one. hang on, hang on. But Shinobu this time manages to get in a choke in the middle of the ring with both hooks in, but Akira valiantly crawls away to the ropes. At this point, she's starting to resemble something out of a Japanese horror film. Again, insert a picture of Carrie here. Or the grudge. Yes, the grudge meets Carrie. Yeah. Ugh, that's a scary (laughs) thought. That's a horror film waiting to happen. Shinobu goes to the well too many times. Goes to the the well? We're going up to the ring now. (laughs) Yeah, no, she's gone out of the ring, found a well. Oh no, I know what you mean. The ring, the film. <laughs> Sorry, I'm with you. I thought you meant the wrestling ring. No, I meant the ring. I was like the grudge carrying ah. the ring. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. Shinobu goes to the well too many times. And while attempting another powerbomb, it is reversed into a hurricane runner and then gets powerbombed herself. Akira spinning wheel kicks Shinobu to the outside and lands a senton to the outside. Get backs in and delivers a missile drop kick to the outside as well. They both must have just killed her back. Yeah. Look. Is that always? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looked like it hurt. Like, honestly, I just can't understand how this match, because it was a long match. Yeah. Like, it was a good pace, but it just felt long because they looked like they were in so much pain. Yeah. I was like, oh, please yeah. stop. Please can this end? Like, I feel like one of you's going to die. Yeah. It Does it intense. make it worse now, knowing that about Akira's neck injury a few years before? And she was doing moves like missile drop kicks to the yeah. outside once they get back into the ring akira shouts something to the heavens and the crowd erupt but she takes too much time and is caught in an arm bar again and is almost made to tap if it wasn't for another rope break kandori lands ahmed johnson's old pearl river plunge i guess it's a double underhook sit out power bomb but it may have a better name than that. Akira hits another bridging suplex for two and the crowd explode, knowing that they are seeing something special this night. She hits a brain buster for another close fall, but when going for it a second time, it's reversed and Kandori lands a brain buster. It really is an equal match and they are both pushing each other to the limit here. Now, I don't know any Japanese, but the commentators keep saying yo-yo. 
oh, it sounds like they're saying yo-yo, and I got really distracted. So mm. I don't know what that means in Japanese, but they kept saying yo-yo. I didn't pick up on it, but maybe it means back and forth? Maybe. Up and down like a yo-yo, back and forth. Could do. It might do. I'm but they kept sure. saying yo-yo, and I was getting really distracted. <laughs> I can't say I noticed. <laughs> In the closing moments, Akira buckles Kandori with a nasty-looking forearm. She then returns the favour with one of her own, and in a last-ditch effort to come out on top, they both land devastating forearms to each other at the same time. But Akira manages to just about crawl to her opponent and secure the three-count, in which is highly regarded as one of the best female matches of all time. So, Vicky, that was Akira Hokuto versus Shinobu Kandori. What were your thoughts on the match? I thought it was a really good match. It looked like a horror film, yeah. but I like horror films. And I'm so glad that I know that it's not 100% real and that they were okay. Right. Like, even knowing about, like, Hokuto's past and knowing that she had suffered, like, bad injuries. If it was an MMA fight, I would have been so on edge with that amount of blood. Yeah. But yeah, it was just, it did look like a horror film, but I thought they sold it so well. And although it was a long match, mm. it wasn't boring. I thought the pacing was good. Yeah. But yeah, no, I really liked it. I gave it four and a half stars out of five. Four and a half. Mm. Yeah. Do you think it was the best women's match of all time? I haven't seen any good women's matches, like really good for a long time. Mm. So I'd be interested to see the other ones on this list. Mm. Because do you know how many women's matches there are? I don't know off the top of my head, no. But it'd be interesting to compare it. The reason why I didn't give it five mm. was one, the amount of blood, and two, it looked too painful. Like there were some bits I thought they were genuinely hurt. Mm. And as a wrestling fan, I'm all for kayfabe and believing things and making it believable, but I don't want to genuinely think people are hurt. So that's the only things that I've marked it down on. Mm. But as I said, half a point, four and a half out of five. Yeah. I mean, that's still a great match, isn't it? Yeah. Four and a half. So where would you put it on your list of the three that we've watched so far? Second. Do you think it was better than the Will Ospreay match that we yeah. watched? I think, I think I'll put it second as well, but I think it's a five star. I think the amount of blood is crazy, but it really does add to the drama of the match. Yeah. I don't want people to bleed in every single match and it lose its specialness, if that's the right term for it. It's but, special because they bled. But do you know what I mean? I it adds that, mean. it takes it to the next level sometimes. Whereas if it's hardcore wrestling and like deathmatch wrestling and it's in every match, I don't think it, it doesn't feel as special anymore. No. But if you have like one of these type of matches, say on like your big shows like the WrestleManias or the Wrestle Kingdoms, then it really does stand out because it feels like such a big thing. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. So we're both agreeing to put it into second place so far? Second place so far. Mm hmm. Four and a half for me, five for me. I know I did really enjoy it. So this is what Dave Meltzer had to say about the matchup Akira Hokuto pinned Shinobu Kandori in 30 minutes. Fans were into this one from the beginning and it looked like a fight. In reality, Kandori isn't that great of a worker, but fans believe her to be a real shooter because of her judo background, so it just works. Hokuto was amazing in carrying her. The only drawback in a way is what also made the match, and that was the copious amounts of blood spilled. Kandori reversed a tombstone pile driver while they were both standing on a ringside table, and Hokuto was cut, actually, by the second ref and was drenched in blood. Kandori also was cut after a chair shot. Big moves included Hokuto doing a flip splash from the top rope to the floor and a drop kick from the top turnbuckle 
onto Kandori who was standing on the outside. The latter move was spectacular. Because of all the blood and the fact that it went so long and looked like a realistic life or death struggle, this is a very dramatic match that will be among the most memorable of the year. Both kicked out of the Northern Light Bombs, a body slam dropped into a pile driver, before both being knocked out and Hokuto crawled onto Kandori for the pin. The Pro Wrestling Torch also wrote a little bit as well, when they wrote, A Japanese correspondent who had seen hundreds of events said that this was possibly the best card he has ever seen. A five star show. Akira Hokuto pinned Shinobu in 30 minutes 27 seconds in a bloodbath ending and extremely hardcore dramatic match. Hokuto is considered one of the best wrestlers in the world. So that's it for episode 3 guys. What did you think of the match? Do you think it's one of the best female matches of all time? Do you think it's one of the best matches of all time in general? Do you think it's overrated or aged not so well? Whatever your thoughts are, please let us know as we would love to find out what you think about this match. What matches do you think we should watch next in this series? If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, hit the subscribe button and check out all our other videos as your support is what will keep this channel going. So it's a bye from Vicky. Bye guys. And it's a bye from me. Bye. And hopefully we'll see you for another installment soon. Somebody once told me the world is gonna roll me. I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. She was looking kind of dumb with her finger and her thumb and the shoe of an owl on her forehead.